Welcome to 1967 of Soviet Space Program. We now have access to a massive rocket, and with that, big ambitions for cosmonauts to get close and personal with the moon. To start the year, a Cosmos 2 takes flight on the 9th of February. As part of the Advanced Commercial Applications Program, we are required to launch a commercial payload of 50 units to a targeted Tundra orbit. The Tundra orbits are a fair bit easier to reach compared to geostationary, so these missions can still be flown on the Cosmos 2. After reaching the parking orbit, we find the target location in the map view and plot a maneuver to get somewhere around a 20 hour period. Next up, changing the plotting frame to Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, so we can fine-tune the maneuver such that the Apogee ends up hovering over the target zone. From there, the restartable 11D-33 fires back up to enter into a transfer orbit. The craft will coast for roughly 11 hours, before the upper stage reignites for one final time achieving a 23-hour, 56-minute period. This contract has a requirement to loiter over the target zone for eight continuous hours. We manage to knock this out before we even perform a full orbit. Back at the Space Center, money is starting to pile up. And there is a good reason for that as we have reached the completion of the R-56 launch complex. And here is where we will be doing a whole lot of spending. We now unveil the R-56, the people's moon rocket for the race to the lunar surface. With 14 RD-253 engines on the first stage and six RD-0210s on the second, this two-stage rocket has a high thrust to weight ratio and can get a 60-ton payload to orbit with 8,900 meters per second of Delta V. The payload in this case is a lunar Soyuz, which is designed to be able to capture into a lunar orbit and return the brave cosmonauts back to Earth. But before integration can begin, we need engineers to staff the launch complex. All the existing staff from the two smaller LCs are immediately moved over and then we purchase tooling with 360,000 funds from our credit pool. We unfortunately are 2,000 funds short from being able to integrate. So we pass a day of time and then head back into the VAB to make the purchase. Being a new LC with partial staffing, the projected build time is almost 290 days, placing the completion in the month of December. We are going to want to speed that up, so facility construction is throttled back to 75%, giving us more daily spending power. The next task is to staff up the launch complex. Auto hire is set for 2,000 engineers, and then a whole lot of time warping. The facility is now staffed to 1,500 engineers, and we see that the completion for the R-56 is now estimated for mid-October. We don't want to accidentally delay the launch due to untrained cosmonauts, so this is the point where we select our group of three to begin taking their Soyuz mission training. Then, we return to even more time warping. After almost seven months of just passing time, the R-56 is finally completed. But the time warping doesn't end here, as we need another 37 days to roll this out to the pad. It's at this point that I realized I forgot to do one important thing, and that is building a second R-56 pad. This pad will be constructed at a rate of 110% to play catch up in hopes that we will not delay the moon landing attempt. One last thing before we move on with the launch. 2,000 science points are sitting around collecting dust, so we head on over to research and development. 
We begin by investing in all of the Lunar Exploration Era Tech nodes, and then move over to research space station prototypes, as well as station development, space station era material science, and early space stations. We move down and grab the two life support nodes, and then work our way through the orbital rocketry branch to reach the node with the RD-270. With plenty of science remaining, we follow up with researching prototype fuel-rich staged combustion, space station era electronics research, and its associated child nodes. With all this new research, we are also going to immediately hire another 100 researchers, and then set auto hire to get us to 3,000. And now, for the main event. The three cosmonauts are strapped in to the top of the R-56, aiming to perform the first lunar orbit. A successful ignition of all 14 engines, and the R-56 begins accelerating off the pad. It may seem kind of strange launching a Soyuz with an R-56 before it even had a chance to fly on the R-7. But given how the programs are structured in the new version of RP-1, the opportunity did not come up. So a traditional Soyuz flight will be performed sometime later. Two and a half minutes after liftoff, the first stage depletes and the six RD-0210s fire up, continuing the crew towards orbit. Two minutes to stage cutoff, an engine experiences a failure. The opposite engine was shut down before we lost complete control, and the rocket successfully returns back on course. If any additional engine failures occur, it can jeopardize the attempt for reaching the moon. The next minute of the flight carries a lot of tension, but then a sigh of relief as the R-56 achieves stage cutoff and places the cosmonauts in a 180 kilometer parking orbit. For the next hour, the crew will perform final system checks in preparation for the translunar injection. Then, the moment of truth. The RD-0212 successfully fires up and sets the cosmonauts on course to intercept the moon. Much like the rest of the R-56, this is the maiden flight and carries with it an increased risk of engine failure. Completing the maneuver, the crew is now moonbound. The next action is to flip the craft 180 degrees and decouple the Soyuz from the upper stage. The cosmonauts have a two and a half day journey to lunar space and we'll be putting that time to use by performing various experiments within the Earth's space high region, previously unexplored during the Vostok and Voskhod missions. A little over two and a half days into the journey, details of the lunar surface are becoming more visible to the cosmonauts on board. The approach from the night side doesn't do much justice, but that will be changing in a few hours when they will be executing the capture burn on the far side. As the crew begins nearing the Paraloon, they initiate a 600 meter per second burn to capture them into a six hour orbital period. The Lunar Soyuz engine group has a very low thrust so entering into a low circular orbit will be best done split across two maneuvers. The second pass will take 330 meters per second and place the cosmonauts in a low 130 kilometer circular orbit. What once was considered a fantasy has now become reality as tomorrow performs the first EVA in lunar orbit. It was only six years ago that the first human flew into space, and now we have stretched that accomplishment to Earth's closest neighbor. 
For this specific contract, the crew will be required to stay in orbit for a minimum of 20 hours before returning to Earth. During that time, the team will continue performing crew reports, operating experiments, and testing out the maneuverability of the lunar Soyuz. All for preparations for the upcoming lunar landing attempt. And it is a good thing that the cosmonauts are testing the craft, as a design anomaly was identified with the forward roll thrusters, which appear to no longer be operating after entering lunar space. The engineers at home will have to do further testing to understand this issue, and implement corrections before the next mission is flown. 14 orbits later, the crew receives notice that the mission duration around the moon has been achieved, and they are approved to plot a return course to Earth. An initial 860 meter per second maneuver will be executed to get it in the general vicinity of Asia. And from there, the cosmonauts will coast for roughly six hours before they execute a course correction. The return we plotted will have the cosmonauts re-entering over Saudi Arabia and flying in a trajectory that should land them back somewhere in Kazakhstan. The journey home will take close to six days, so all there is for the crew to do is sit back, relax, and enjoy the barbecue roll. T minus one hour before re-entry. The crew begins preparations and verify all scientific samples have been transferred over to the descent capsule. Then, at 300 kilometers altitude, the orbital and service modules are decoupled. It is here that the crew identifies a grave error, as the capsule is left without any attitude control. The engineering teams have forgotten to install a critical component, that being the descent control thrusters. The crew will be at the mercy of aerodynamic forces to correctly reorient the heat shield into the airstream and provide a safe return home. It's just their luck though, as they were only 30 degrees off from the prograde marker and the capsule easily shifts back into the airstream. That design error could have easily ended the mission in a disaster, so we'll have to hope that there aren't any more surprises that can endanger the crew. Streaking through the sky at a speed over 10 kilometers per second, this is the most aggressive re-entry the space agency has ever attempted. Even with a 60 kilometer periapsis, the descent was not quite steep enough, causing the capsule to perform a skip. But this is actually a good thing, as it helped the crew fly over Iran and have a much closer landing to the Space Center. During the final phase of the descent, all three crew begin reaching their G-limits, and tomorrow passes out briefly. The heat shield has performed its job, and now the capsule just has to wait for the altitude trigger to deploy the parachute. And gently bring the crew down to the surface. A safe landing, and notifications signifying the success for the crewed lunar flyby and orbit contracts. With the return of the crew comes a large lump of science, as well as being labeled national heroes, recognized globally for being the first humans to orbit the moon. Now we may already have an R-56, but I have a soft spot for the Proton. We're going to make a crew rated LC for this and plan to utilize it for the upcoming stations program. 
This construction will take a year and a half to complete, so we'll check back in with it in two episodes. December 22nd. There is one final flight for the year, and that will be for a targeted geostationary contract under the Advanced Crewed Applications Program. It might have been possible to squeeze this on a Cosmos 2, but I just decided to brute force it and use the more capable Molnia rocket. Block L upper stage for this launch has been upgraded to replace the 11D33 with the more capable RD58. Another reason in utilizing the R58 is that we need more flight data on these engines, as they will play an important part in the upcoming crewed lunar landing. After achieving orbit, we next plot a maneuver so that we can line up the ascending node with the planned apogee, and then adjust it further so we get one lined up over the planned target zone. The upper stage lights back up. and hits the planned orbit effortlessly. The next step will be to circularize and enter the geostationary orbit. This is made much easier with Principia, as you can set the maneuver to inertially fixed and simply burn retrograde when you are plotting in the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame. After the coast, and the final burn, the mission is a success. In all, we got a bit of data on the RD-58 and accomplished another required contract for the Advanced Commercial Applications Program. Thanks for watching and see you next time.